All right, the recording is on. Good morning once again, everybody. BC213, the end times. This is our third week. Um, yeah, the third week of lectures. And uh, we're getting into some exciting things today. So welcome everybody. Let's um, pray together and then we will get started. I'd uh, request somebody to please unmute your mic and lead the class in prayer, and then we will start. Who would like to pray? Okay. I'm praying. Go ahead, please. Our Father, we bless and thank you this morning for this wonderful opportunity <clears throat> to be in your presence once again and to fellowship, to learn and to study. Father, we pray that you continue to be our instructor, lead us in this journey. Father, we pray for an open understanding. And Lord, we pray that grants pastor the utterances to be able to explain things to us to the best of our understanding. We pray that, Lord, may you continue to guide our hearts to grasp whatever we, we are taught here and to lead our lives into a glorious moment. We thank you and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elisha. And once again, everybody, good morning. Welcome. Or if you're in some other part of the world, uh, yeah, it could be evening or it could be afternoons. Okay. All right. So we are making progress in our study on the end times. Um, we have gone through an introduction uh, to how we are going to approach the subject. Then in the next chapter, we uh, talked about the fact that the Bible is a prophetic book we can rely on the prophetic scriptures. And then we also did a quick overview of uh, Matthew 24 last week, uh, just to see the sequence, and in, as an introduction, the sequence of events as outlined in Matthew 24. Now, what we're gonna do today uh, is a little bit more of geography and history. So the next two chapters, I hope I can complete both those chapters in this hour. Uh, a little bit about the geography, the areas that are of interest, or the regions that are of interest, and a little bit about the historical background. Uh, so there'll be two chapters on that. Then after that, um, hopefully after the break, if that's a lecture of the break, we'll get into the main part of the course, which is a panoramic overview of the sequence of end time events. So we're gonna be spending uh, many hours on that chapter where we're going to go in detail on the sequence of events. How are things going to unfold as given to us in scripture? And then we will answer a lot of questions, you know, about uh, uh, the rapture and the tribulation, what happens in heaven, what happens on earth, and you know, all those details we'll get into. Um, but in order for us to, you know, have good understanding of those things, it's useful for us to have a little background of the geography, the areas that are of interest, and also a little bit about the history. So you, we understand, you know, why is there going to be conflict and so on and so forth. Okay, so we're going to cover two chapters uh, on that. Uh, and I'm not getting into too much detail, but it's more of an, uh, you know, a high level understanding of these things. So that when we read scripture, we are able to understand what the Bible is talking about, right? And uh, the PDF for all of these have been um, made available in the coursework section, so you can uh, please um, review them uh, when you have time after the class, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, the PDF and we'll get started, all right. So the first is we're going to talk a little bit about the geography, the areas that are of interest and a background to these. Um, so 
This chapter is called uh, the Middle East and other regions in Bible prophecy. Now, a lot of the focus in Bible prophecy is around the Middle East. So the book of Genesis basically starts right here between Tigris and Euphrates. So in um, Genesis chapter 2, we read about the Garden of Eden being somewhere here between Tig the, the river Tigris and Euphrates. And so, you know, everything started here. And then Abraham was then called out of uh, somewhere here, the Ur of the Chaldees, somewhere in Iraq. Or, and then he, was, he journeyed all the way into this land here in Jerusalem. And then for some time, he went down even into Egypt. Right? And so he was there. So a lot of the, uh, the uh, biblical uh, ge uh, geography, the Bible geography, is around the Middle East, around these regions. And then, uh, very interestingly, and we will get into the details of this in the third year when we study Daniel, but I want to uh, just give you a quick uh, uh, understanding, a quick summary of what Daniel has given to us. Uh, in Daniel chapter two, uh, Daniel sees the vision. Um, I mean, he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream where uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees this image uh, of go with a gold head and silver um, chest and uh, the brass uh, waist and iron legs, and then the feet mixed with iron clay, then 10 toes. Then after that, uh, 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 a kingdom that God himself sets up here on earth. And then as we progress through the book of Daniel, we can interpret what basically uh, we will understand. Uh, and then in chapter 7, Dan Daniel himself has a vision in the first year of King Belshazzar uh, uh, about the lion, the bear, the, the, great, the beasts that come up. And they parallel uh, the image that he has seen. And, uh, you know, there's interpretation given that these are the regions. So basically the empires, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, subsequently the Greek, and then the Roman. Although he doesn't mention Roman, we know it comes right after the Greek, the Romans took over. And, uh, and then in chapter eight, Daniel has another vision in the, I think it was the second or third year of King Belshazzar. And he sees a ram and the goat, and he, inter he tells us the ram represents the Medo-Persian, empire and the goat represents the Greek empire. So uh, all of these uh, empires basically were around the Mediterranean covering Europe, and we will see the map later on, covering Europe, Northern Africa, and a little bit of uh, uh, Turkey uh, and the, around the Middle East, Mediterranean, where Israel and other countries are. Uh, so this entire geographical region occupied by these empires are of importance to us because um, in, in Bible prophecy, what happens is out of what was the former Roman empire, there would be 10 leaders that emerge. There would be a loosely held region of iron and clay that came out of the former uh, Roman Empire, loosely held. From there come 10 kings or leaders. And then there's another leader who comes, the little horn that we read about last year, class, who eventually is the Antichrist. He overpowers three of the 10 leaders, and then he comes into uh, his place of power and he does whatever. And it is during that time that Daniel prophesied that the God of heaven will set up his kingdom here on earth. So this geographical region is of importance or interest to us. Um, and um, what we will see in Daniel's prophecy is that he clearly spoke about the goat, um, the empire, which represents the Greek empire. He gave us details in chapter eight of Daniel that um, and the, the Greek empire will grow strong very powerfully under its first leader, which we know is Alexander the Great. And then he said, but that leader will die very early, which happened, Alexander the Great died in his early thirties. And then he said that empire will be divided into four parts, which actually happened because 
the four generals of uh, Alexander the Great took portions of the Greek empire. And then Daniel said that the little horn will come out of one of these four. So that's why those four regions into which the Greek empire was divided subsequently is of, again interest to us geographic because out of one of those would come the little horn, right? So I've kind of summarized uh, very quickly uh, these areas of uh, interest. So let's look at some of these things. So what do we see in the Middle East uh, after the Roman Empire, the Islamic Empire came into power and that they expanded uh, uh, throughout the Middle East. They overpowered all those regions, that many of the regions that were once part of um, the Roman Empire. And uh, they, uh, so today, many of the nations surrounding Israel. So you look at Israel, a tiny piece of land, but they are completely surrounded by Arab nations, you know. And uh, th this has led to a lot of tension, right? And we will zero in on some of these. So um, this is again of interest to us because we understand the conflicts uh, that are happening. Um, Israel became a nation, May 14, 1948. And since then, there's been ongoing conflict, Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the European Union is of interest to us because it sits on the region that was actually part of the former Roman Empire. So if you look at the Roman Empire, which again, we see from Daniel's prophecy, it sits very much in part, not completely, but a good or a large portion of the Roman Empire sits, or, uh, let me put it like this, a large portion of the European Union sits on the region that was once part of the Roman Empire. And Daniel prophesied uh, in Daniel chapter two that after the Roman Empire, that is the empire of iron, there will be a loosely held region of iron and clay where people of the former, former Roman Empire will mix with other races and it will be a loosely held region. And so it's very interesting because today when you look at, uh, and these are the countries that uh, overlap from the, from the European Union that overlap with the Roman Empire, I've highlighted Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. I will mention why I've highlighted there, those countries. But when you look at the European Union, of course, we're leaving the United Kingdom out. Uh, you see that a lot of the European Union overlaps with what was once part of the Roman Empire. Right? Now, of course, a large portion of Germany and Poland has, are, are left out, but a lot of other countries overlap. Right now, this is so important because in Daniel's prophecy, he talked about a loosely held region of iron and clay. That means iron representing the former Roman Empire, clay representing all the other races of the earth that they mix, they intermingle, they're loosely held. And then he said, out of this region will emerge 10 leaders, 10 leaders. 10 kings, 10 leaders and their nations. So we have, we are watching very closely, you know, who are these dominant players coming out of this region, this loosely held, and, and, and it's so true. It's a very loosely held, it's a European Union, they're independent countries, but yet they are kind of, you know, trying to function as one, you know, with one currency and a lot of other things, a lot of economic uh, uh, understanding among them in that region. So it's very loosely held. It's almost like exactly uh, what Daniel chapter 2 spoke about. And then he said they will emerge these 10 leaders. So we're looking, okay, what are the 10 nations that are being dominant? 10 leaders are coming into prominence. And then the other thing that Daniel said was that from what used to be part of the Greek empire. So you're starting off here with Greece 
and then you're going across the Mediterranean, you're going across into Turkey and, and Egypt and Syria. So that's why I highlighted those four countries. Uh, this whole region, Greece, Turkey, Egypt down here in the south, and Syria over here. These were part of the Greek empire. Now, uh, now, again, when I say, remember, uh, actually, there are a lot of small, small, small countries here. But when I say Greece, you know, we mean this whole region here. Uh, that was taken over by one of the emperors of uh, Alexander the Great. When his, um, after he died, then this region was taken over, like basically part of Turkey was taken over. And then uh, the region below that was taken over by another one. And then Egypt was taken over by another emperor. So what Daniel said was, uh, and, uh, he said that from one of the four divisions of the Greek empire would come the little horn, which is the Antichrist. So we are looking again, so we are looking at 10 leaders who would emerge from what was the former Roman empire. We're also looking at regions, these regions that, well, you know, that Broke out, broke out of the Greek empire from which the little horn will arise. And generally speaking, we are saying Greece, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, it could be uh, some other nation, but these seem to be the more dominant countries today from what used to be those four uh, area uh, regions that broke out of the Greek empire. So we're looking at that with interest because these are all in Daniel's prophecies uh, about the end times. And we're saying, you know, who could be those 10 leaders coming out of the European Union? And from which one of these nations would emerge a leader who would overthrow three of these leaders? I mean, he's going to come in, be aggressive, take over. And then he's going to come into power. It's almost like these 10 leaders are going to help this one little horn come into prominence and so we are of interest another region of interest in bible prophecy is russia so uh, you know when we read about we will read some of these scriptures later on as we go through the sequence of events i'm just giving uh, an introduction to the geography so russia has spoken of both in ezekiel 38 and 39 and uh, what will happen is uh, Russia will be the first mover in this whole lead up to the battle of Armageddon. So Russia will invade Israel from the north. So while, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there's some, some sort of a peace treaty in place, Russia is going to start disrupting it. Russia is going to begin to move in from the north and it will have its allies. And, and these are these are all mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Uh, Persia, Persia refers to Iran and Iraq, uh, Ethiopia, Libya, parts of Germany and Slovakia, and Turkey and Egypt. So these will form allies, and many of these are Arab nations. Uh, they will form become allies to Russia. So today, these nations are all around Israel. And when Russia begins to make its move of aggression towards Israel, these people will join in, in the first move. But very interestingly, Ezekiel 39 says, Israel is going to push, that little nation of Israel is actually going to push Russia back, Ezekiel 39. And then, okay, I, I will, okay, so that's, so Russia is very of interest to us, seeing what's happening with Russia. Then the second sequence that will happen is China, most likely China. The Bible does not mention China, but it talks about kings from the East in Revelation 16. Okay. And uh, previous to that, Revelation 9, we, we see about uh, 200 million troops. Uh, and later on in Revelation 16, he's talking about kings from the east. So who could be most likely kings from the east so with, with large armies aside from Russia? So this is why we say most likely this is going to be China and others who join in with China. 
right? So once Russia has pushed back, China's gonna step in. The kings from the east are gonna step in, Revelation 16. And they are going to begin to move towards Israel. And God is going to, you know, uh, so that's going to happen. And this will subsequently lead to a third and final battle where all nations are going to converge. Obviously, other nations are not going to sit down and just let Russia and China play a big role. So it's going to pull in all nations, you know, and most likely we could say with all confidence, the, the United States and its allies, which would be UK, Canada and other nations would get in because they're not going to sit down and just watch Russia and China start attacking Israel. They're going to come in. And so that's going to cause all nations, Revelation 19, to come into battle. And they're all going to converge in a place called Megiddo or the Valley of Jezreel or uh, for the battle of Armageddon. Right. So where is this Megiddo? You know, it very interestingly, this Megiddo or Valley of Jezreel has been a battleground for centuries. Right. So historically, this has been a place of fighting uh, for over the, the, the 34 recorded battles that have taken place right here. Uh, and uh, uh, so the General Allen B fought the Ottoman Turks in 1918, which subsequently led to Israel. I mean. Zionists proclaiming Israel about 30 years later uh, as an independent nation. So the valley, of, the Jezreel Valley, Megiddo Valley, which where the Battle of Armageddon will take place is of importance. So the nations will converge here. And, and obviously, you know, giving, given today's uh, uh, um, weapons of war, uh, these weapons of war are not localized. They are, you know, they can be, you know, the intercontinental ballistic missiles can be shot from anywhere. So uh, we must understand that this convergence is only an, an escalation of conflict. But the fighting is going to happen, obviously, you know, everywhere, the, 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 the Air Force and whatever. But this is the region where the convergence will happen and give rise to conflict and uh, and the nations of the earth will come here the river euphrates by this time would be dried up and they will be able to move in and it is around this time as the nations converge that revelation 19 the lord jesus himself will descend with the armies of heaven and he will destroy by the word of his mouth the nations and you know the bible tells us that the blood is going to flow as high as the horse's who you know a horse's bridle which is probably like about five feet for about almost 300 miles 280 miles or so there's going to be blood flowing and it's going to be very huge it's going to be huge devastation okay and it's going to take place in here in this region north uh, towards the northern part of israel or northern part north of jerusalem so that's another region of interest so when you try to imagine again this is based on you know what we see in the bible the the battle of armageddon you're having the king of the north russia invading you're having the kings of the east coming in most likely you know china and other allies of course uh, when when russia moves in the arab nations around as we mentioned will join in with russia egypt from the south uh, and there is uh, Turkey and Syria from the north, uh, and they'll join with Russia, and it will pull in all the nations of the earth. So we can we can see that there will be uh, engagement from other nations all taking place over here. Okay, and uh, so these are you know geographically speaking areas of interest, territories or countries of interest uh, that we are looking at okay now let me just cover a little bit of the history and then we will take time for questions now if you want to look at it from a historical from the history background israel so this is the next chapter 
uh, Israel and uh, its people. So we know that uh, Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees, so must be somewhere here in modern day Iraq, or you know, and then he journeyed down into this land that God said, I will give to you. So he journeyed in, he came to the land of promise, and God told him that the region from the river Nile, the river of Egypt, to the river Euphrates, way up north, he said, that's the land that's going to be yours. Right? So, and from the Western Sea, to the wilderness of Lebanon, where, uh, so all of that, so uh, east, west, north, south, that's the region I'm giving to you. Okay. So that's been the land that the Jewish people uh, have claimed as their own. And are, they're always considered as their own. Now, they, you know, eventually they came, they settled in their land, God gave them the feasts and all of those things. Uh, and they gave them the covenants and the Abraham made the mosaic. And, and so they were dwelling in this land for quite a long time. But subsequently, now I'm running through the history. Uh, you, you know, this is just for us to understand and you don't, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail and I'm not expecting you to remember everything, but so uh, this is just for us to under understand things. So Abraham came, settled into the land. Uh, David was one of the uh, most, uh, what to say, respected kings, uh, patriarchs who established Israel in its land. And then came Solomon, again, another great king. He built the temple and uh, subsequent to Solomon, you know, they started fighting among themselves. So there was the 10 tribes and there were the, the uh, two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin in the south, the 10 tribes in the north. So they were divided amongst themselves, which didn't do them good. Uh, the Assyrians, people from the north uh, came in, uh, conquered. So they now became vulnerable to attacks. So eventually the the Assyrians attacked them, but the major dispersion happened when Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, in the sixth century BC. He came in, he destroyed the temple that Solomon had built. Uh, he took a lot of the Jewish people out into Babylon, into exile, and so on. Uh, and then subsequent to that Babylonian empire, there were a lot of other empires that came in, the Medo-Persians, um, then the Greeks, then the Romans. Uh, now, in between what had happened, when the Persians came in, uh, they sent the Jewish people back and they rebuilt the temple. It's called, it was known as a second temple, right? Uh, during the time of uh, Zerubbabel and Haggai um, and uh, Ezra the priest and Nehemiah, the rebuilding the walls. We are familiar with those uh, accounts. So the second temple was rebuilt. And uh, uh, then, you know, then after the Persians came the Greeks, Alexander the Great, he brought in the Greek language uh, into this region. So uh, people in this region who were generally speaking Hebrew. Uh, so during the time of Babylonians, they began to speak Aramaic. So the, the Jews who were dispersed in Babylon, they learned Aramaic. So the book of Daniel, a good portion of it, chapters two to seven is actually written in Aramaic in the Old Testament. They came back here, and by the time Alexander the Great came, uh, so they now they started learning Greek, so that's why the New Testament is written in Greek. So you've got the Old Testament, Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, some parts written in Aramaic, the New Testament because of the Greek influence written in Greek. After the, Gre uh, the Greeks, uh, we had a, a, a short time uh, of the Seleucid um, uh, Empire, there was a revolt and so on. But then the more dominant was the Romans. They came into power and they, for more than a thousand years till about, uh, I think 1100 BC were in major part, major control of most of those 
region. So the Romans came in. Uh, the Romans in AD 70 destroyed the second temple. So the second temple was destroyed in AD 70. And Jesus foretold us. He said, you know, uh, not one stone will be left. So that's something you must keep in mind. So they, the Romans, they destroyed the Temple Mount. Uh, the Jews were dispersed. And, um, uh, you know, they were basically, they lost their land. So this has happened several times. The Jewish people were dispersed out of their country, their, their territory many times. Assyrians, Babylonians. Then they were, you know, the Greeks came in, the Romans came in. They were all dispersed. Subsequently to that, the like we said, uh, the is Islam spread all across the region. So Muslims or the or this Islam, uh, the Muslims took over that region, and around 690, they constructed the Dome of the Rock. And uh, they established, they built, uh, eventually they built their own uh, mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So that same place, which uh, because, you know, the, the, the Muslims traced their ancestry back to a Abraham. And because that place Abra where the uh, Solomon had built his temple it was sacred because Abraham offered Isaac there. David, King David, uh, built the you know bought that piece of land, and Solomon built the temple. So it is sacred to the Jews, but also to uh, the Muslims or the Arabs. And so they eventually built the Dome of the Rock and they built their own structures over there. So. After the after the, um, you know, the, the the Muslims occupied this land, this region, slowly the, um, the so eventually the, the Ottoman Turks, the Turkish Empire, was was over there in that, in that entire region. Little by little, we, we, we call, uh, there was the migration of Jews slowly back into that region. They were coming back, you know, slowly in 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 uh, waves. They began to move into that region, and uh, mainly from Russia and parts of Europe, they began to move in. And uh, there was subsequently World War One. Uh, the British came in, and they overthrew the Turkish or the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so that was very, what to say? Uh, maybe I should say instrumental in. Uh, preparing the way for uh, the eventual uh, establishing of the Jewish or Israel as a nation. So that happened around 1918. Uh, we have the Second World War and uh, then began the whole call for a land for the Jews and a land for the Arabs. So by this time, a lot of the Jews had migrated back into their, into that region. The, uh, what we know as Israel today, and there was a call. Okay, you know, we, you know, the Jews wanted their own land, the Arabs or the Palestinians wanted their land, and in a very very quick uh, move, the uh, the Zionists at that had known uh, at that time, they came together and they declared Israel as an independent state. So it was a very quick move on their part. And of course, uh, the British troops were there uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, in some way it was like, maybe like a moral support, I think. But, uh, and uh, Israel was recognized by US and Russia immediately. Uh, of course, it caused a lot of reaction from Arab nations. And uh, so there were several Arab-Israeli wars, uh, but 
very amazingly that throughout all of these wars that were fought, uh, every time a war, 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 war was fought, it seemed like the Jews were just expanding their territory. Israel seemed to be gaining more land. And so uh, the 1967 Six-Day War is, is again very, very significant because uh, Israel captured a lot of the region that belonged to them. Right? And then uh, as a way to make peace, they gave concession uh, and they handed back part of the city of Jerusalem to the Arabs in some other regions. Um, so then there have been you know, a, a lot of efforts uh, to make peace because conflict continued in this, in this area. A lot of efforts to make peace, right? And, and you could see uh, over the years. And it's an ongoing thing. So what are some of the notable things, historically speaking? Well, the mo most notable would be the uh, Israel being formed as a nation on May 14th, 1948. For almost 2,500 years, nobody thought, you know, from the time they were dispersed under the Babylonian captivity, nobody thought that they could actually all come back and take full control of their land. But that happened, 1948, and subsequently after the 1967 war, they were able to gain control of their region. And so Ezekiel 36 is uh, very significant in, in speaking towards the regathering of Israel as a nation. Then, so you, know, so you can see it. But of course, uh, there is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip that's occupied by the Palestinians, or uh, uh, some understand them to be uh, descendants of the Philistines who were always traditionally historically, uh, uh, you know, enemies with Israel. So the Palestinians have a good portion of Jerusalem. And of course, the Temple Mount uh, and, the, and the Dome uh, is occupied now by the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, uh, the Dome of the Rock. So that has, um, you know, uh, continued conflict here. Yeah. So Israel, Occupied by, uh, surrounded by Arab nations, Le Lebanon, Syria, J Jordan, Egypt, and West Bank, Gaza, occupied by the Palestinians, and the Temple Mount being a major source of conflict. So, like we said, you know, the Temple Mount is historically important to both Jews and Arabs, uh, the Muslims because they all trace their ancestry back to Abraham. This was, what he, this was where he brought Isaac to be sacrificed. King David purchased it and he built an altar there. Solomon built the first temple there, which was destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt by Zerubbabel, the second temple. Herod the Great, King Herod, he enlarged that whole area renovated it, but it was later destroyed by the Romans. And then later on, the Arabs or Muslims built uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their structures on it. So, um, yeah, so they have their dome and the Al-Aqsa Mosque there on the Temple Mount. So this has been a, a constant place of, uh, conflict. The expectation among, and you can go to templeinstitute.org to get latest information, but the constant expectation among the Jewish, uh, not all, but I'm talking um, about the main, you would say the, 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 the um, fundamental, the traditional Jews, is that they're going to be able to take over and have their third temple and all the preparations for that have been done and you know are in place and you'll get latest information what's happening from templeinstitute.org and uh, there's a nice video uh, if you want to watch uh, where he you know jimmy young uh, talks about this that the readiness of the jewish people to rebuild the temple so 
uh, just some pictures here to uh, understand what we're talking about. Uh, the Dome of the Rock, uh, the Alexa Mosque, and the, the Western Wall is where the Jews will be allowed to come in and do their prayers. Uh, but this is the entire area we're talking about, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which currently major part is occupied by the Arabs or it's meant for the Arabs. The Jews come in and pray on the Western Wall. Right, so that's the Dome of the Rock uh, and the Western Wall from where, where the people, the Jewish people are allowed to come and pray, but they're not allowed to go into the Arab occupied areas, right? The other part is the Jewish settlements. Very interestingly, Jeremiah prophesied, and you can you know look follow these regions, that um, when the city will be rebuilt, he mentioned these areas where uh, it will be rebuilt. And interestingly, that's, I don't know, I don't think it happened intentionally, but uh, when the settlements were built, they were rebuilt in the sequence. So as uh, Israel occupied their land and began to build their settlements, uh, uh, we can see here, um, they fall, I mean, it happened according to Jeremiah's prophecy, the settlements, but the, these settlements are also, a, a, what to say, a reason for conflict. Uh, now, aside from rebuilding their city of Jerusalem and all of those three areas. And now Israel continues to build settlements in territory that is supposedly, um, that is under the Palestinians, you know. And that is where uh, uh, the United Nations basically doesn't recognize that, but nobody's really stopping Israel from doing it. They, they continue to build their settlements and uh, expand but that is a region of conflict and so every now and then there will be fighting happening between the palestinians and the is israelis because of these settlements in addition to the tension all around the temple mount okay so a very quick overview of the geography and the history surrounding these regions i'm going to pause we'll take questions and then after the break, we're going to get into the main part of the course, which is to get a uh, uh, an overview of um, things that are yet to come. So, um, time to wake up in case you were sleeping through uh, the geography and the history. Sorry, Pastor. I, I noticed you, maybe because of time, you, you skipped um, the aspect of the Crusaders, what the Crusaders did. Uh, during the timeline, uh, if you could just provide uh, maybe a high-level um, summary of w why they invaded and um, killed the Jews and the and the Muslims, please. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I, I, we didn't talk too much about that, but um, and, and I'm not I'm not an expert on this, but I'll just make a few comments. Um, so the Crusaders, similar to what the the Arabs did were, I think, were, uh, the mindset was we can advance what we believe in using force, which of course is not the right thing to do. And so in, in a way to expand uh, influence, control and territory, they used force and religion to expand. Yeah, you know, and, and 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 sadly, even the Arabs did that. And I'm not saying these are the right things to do, but that was probably the the mindset at, in those times, and sometimes even today, trying to use force to expand, influence, control, and one's own personal beliefs. Uh, and that, of course, led to a lot of bloodshed things that happened that were, you know, we don't approve of today, but it was done in the name of God, the name of religion. Yeah. 
Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right, Divya, your question, please. Samuel, Divya. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I was uh, uh, thinking of that uh, in Revelation chapter 16, 12 to 16, when you mentioned the kings from the east and uh, you said the other nations will converge. Uh, so is it those Western nations, are they coming uh, like against Israel, like UK, US, those nations, are they coming against all right, Kishan, you will have to mute your mic, please. Okay. All right, go ahead, Divya. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question okay. was: th Are those nations, the Western nations, like UK, US, and all, or are they coming against Israel, or is it for Israel? Mm. Yeah. So. Um, so Revelation 16 talks about the kings of the east moving in. Revelation 19 talks about the nations of the earth coming in. So it is not mentioned by name, right? It doesn't mention by name um, like uh, the US or those things. But because it says the nations of the earth, that means it's, it's a world war. It's all nations being pulled in. And uh, definitely because Russia the Arab, it's other Arab nations have joined together, China coming together. It's most likely that there will be other nations who are in support of Israel, right? And just looking at the current scenario, you know, it's whole, it's very likely that uh, the U.S. and its allies will support Israel. And U.S. has been a very staunch supporter of Israel, so they will support Israel. And but it's going to be nations coming together is what Revelation 19 says. Right? So though it doesn't mention by name, uh, we can, uh, based on what we're seeing, understand that there's going to be nations of the earth drawn into this battle. And there will be those who are supporting Israel and those who are against Israel. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, Samuel. Thank you, Pastor. Um, so broadly, Pastor, two questions. So one is a um, few of the events that happened in the past, um, big ones like uh, the World War One and II, um, where a lot of Jews were massacred, uh, and even the Six-Day uh, uh, Israel-Arab War. Uh, these, in, in, a, in some ways, have some... Uh, parallels with Revelation end of war in in a way like if we didn't know less we one would almost predicate that like if uh, I'm I'm going back like if I'm living uh, sometime in those areas when in those days when the six day war is happening I would almost get like oh, this is this is Revelation coming true like there's bloodshed everywhere Jews are getting killed everywhere and things like that so um, so so that in in that context but while that is happening it seems like uh, so even though some of the things are happening exactly how it's written in the Bible, somehow it's just happening and, and there is no one to stop it or do anything about it. Uh, so which, which also leads me to the second question, like now that we have almost like a detailed process, step by step structure of how the end of days is happening. Um, and I'm, I'm imagining uh, people in in the authorities like UN, US would have people in, in their advisory body who would know um, what the Bible has to say about how nations will emerge from the East, West, how Israel, how the peace treaty is going to happen. Uh, but so this is like, you know, will there be an like you know it's something is written that this is going to happen and this is going to lead to the end of the world and, and you know people know about it and you just can't do anything you just it just keeps happening and, and and there's no interference at all so i'm just thinking like will just people sit by like if you don't know and then it happens like you know you can say like we didn't know and it happened and it things have unfolded the way it's unfolded. But then, um, you know, it's 
clearly said that these are going to happen and you can see okay step one is happening uh, it's like uh, for example let's say the antichrist who comes and and declares a peace treaty uh in the war and and a lot of this what's i mean this person who actually starts doing these things uh matches so i think in the christian world we will know that okay uh, this is what's happened so it's begun and uh, in, i'm imagining in uh, like among the big governments and also there would be people in the advisory who would know this would wouldn't they do like so one i'm i'm not sure how to frame the question but you know just letting things happen despite of seeing it happen uh, it almost seems like uh, you know god's put things in motion and there's nothing that can intervene or that can foil god's plan uh and uh, us knowing all of this like like when antichrist comes into place and declares a peace treaty will no one try to assess or like stop him put him behind bars or anything or will will this just like you know we will know that this is antichrist probably in the christian world would first recognize this person as antichrist but we would just uh, you know because things are in such a way we'll just sit back and just watch the unfolding of the end of times so so that's what uh, Sorry, Pastor, you're Sorry. Yeah, I will quickly respond to Samuel's two uh, questions, and then we will go for a break, right? So for the first part, yes, uh, major things have happened in the sense of World War I, World War II, Six-Day War. But some of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of the things that the Bible had foretold were not happening or could not have happened. Uh, several things, for instance, uh, the 10 nations or the 10 leaders coming in from the former Roman Empire uh, is a more recent thing, which is, came about, you know, some 20 some odd years ago after the, almost 30 years ago, after the formation of the European Union. So it was not possible back then. Uh, and then a lot of other things like uh, we will see uh, a, a global financial system was not possible, you know, back in the 1930s and so on. Or, uh, or, or and, and a global religious system, or you know, uh, so 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 the, the 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 details that we will see in Revelation were not actually uh, fulfilled and could not be fulfilled back in the 30s and the 50s or even in the 70s, but in more recent times, given the advancements in science and technology and so on, we say, yeah, you know just about everything that, the, that we see we read in the rest of Revelation can be fulfilled, which was not possible about 30 some years ago. Right? So that's the difference. That's why uh, if we were living there, we could have all, all already seen that, okay, here, these things are not yet fulfilled. Okay, that's, a, well, that's kind of the response to the first part. The second part of the question is, um, it is true that um, you know the Bible and that the understanding of the scriptures is is very clear these days, but yet it doesn't mean the world leaders themselves actually acknowledge these things. One thing, right? A lot of the people are uh, either atheistic or agnostic, and they don't care about the Bible. Some may be open, some may not. You know, so it's not easy to get everybody on the same page. I'm talking about the leaders of the nations. Um, secondly. Uh, the, the you know the things of, of God will be fulfilled. Like you know when you look back, whether it was Pharaoh, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar, the things of God would be will be fulfilled. And uh, most of the time, it's happening. Uh, uh, the, the the people are not the leaders are not necessarily um, you know regarding the scriptures the way it should be. But the the things of God will be fulfilled. And, uh, you know, Revelation 13 talks about what seems to be an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. You know, that is, uh, he is injured, but he recovers miraculously. So it seems like there will be something happening, uh, you know, of people recognize and maybe try to kill him or whatever, but he's going to survive. And that itself is going to elevate him to a higher place of prominence. And we'll read about that in Revelation 13. Right. So. That's how, how I would respond uh, to these things, that you know, the purpose of God will be fulfilled. Whatever God's spoken will happen. Whether people are aware or not, it's going to unfold that way. Right? 
So let's take a quick break. Thank you, Bess. Yeah, welcome. Uh, we'll take a quick break, and then we will come back and take, uh, I know uh, uh, there are more questions. Uh, we will take those questions after the break, and then we'll get into the main part, which is the, you know, the sequence of events that we want to look at, okay? So in 10 minutes, we'll be back. Thanks. <laughs> 